Welcome back, everyone. It is the first day of our Cabral House Calls. That means it is a Saturday. So if you're tuning in live, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, of course, for your support and all your shares of the podcast. I uh, love being able to bring new people into this community. So what we do on the weekends, again, if you are new to the show, is answer all of our community's questions that have been written in over the past uh, couple months. They're always answered in the order they come in. I'm opening up the big document now. And and it looks like uh, this first one came in from July 26th. And today's the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, around the 18th, right? Around the 18th of September. Uh, so it looks like we are... Uh, about what, seven weeks or so behind. That's normal. It typically takes you about six to eight weeks to get questions answered, depending on how many people write in. So that is what my aim is. Of course, I'm not here to diagnose, treat, or cure any disease. I work on a natural health-based level that combines seven different natural health-based disciplines. Everything is combined. And what I try to do is give you the most integrative health approach I can. And it's based on uh, two decades, more than two decades of practice, hundreds of thousands of client appointments. And uh, again, we've seen pretty much everything there is to see. Everyone is unique in their own way. And all I'm trying to do is give you that right place to start and hopefully a second opinion. All right, so let's get started. First question is coming in from Paloma. Paloma asks, what does Ayurveda advocate dairy? I know it was raw and organic, but isn't the protein the protein an issue? All right, well, let's answer this question. It's a great question, super fair question. And um, Ayurveda does recommend dairy. There's no doubt about it. Now, keep in mind, we're going back 6,000 years, right? Ayurvedic texts were written five, 6,000 years ago. So when we look at this, we're looking at, okay, people living in India, right? It was, it was written in India. We're looking at food sources, what was available, right? And we're looking at uh, how they lived their, their typical lives and what they were looking to achieve. Now, I'm going to mention a couple things here. One, Ayurveda does not recommend dairy for everyone. So they recommend dairy uh, if it's a heating form, which is cow, sorry, not cow, which is goat and sheep, uh, then that would be uh, okay for vata-based body types, right? But they never recommend dairy for more kapha-based body types because kapha is more mucus producing and dairy can produce more mucus as well. Uh, and it's uh, cow's milk is more cooling. So cow's milk was typically only ever recommended for more of the pitta based body type. So Ayurveda gets very in-depth. It's a beautiful form of medicine. It's the original form of medicine. It, it has the most knowledge, I believe. But you do, it, but it's difficult to interpret, which means, you know, you can't just start practicing Ayurveda or read a book and then say, oh, I should be doing this. I think people get a little too willy-nilly on that. Uh, it should definitely be part of a larger scope of practice. Now, the other big difference is it was raw. So when milk is raw, it's easier to digest. It gives you the enzymes along with that, which helps you to break down the actual dairy, which makes it easier to digest. And then, of course, there is the protein issue. Now, cows that we have in the U.S. are very different than the cows that they had in India, right? We're talking about if you get deep into this, you're actually looking at two different forms of cows, two different forms of milk. I won't get that deep into it because I'm just not recommending cow's milk for the average individual. You can make a case for cow's milk dairy if it's raw and grass-fed. You mentioned organic. I'm going to be doing a whole show on this. Organic is not a good quality milk. I want to repeat that. And I know it's controversial, but it's still true. I'll talk about this on a full show. Organic is not the quality milk that you're looking for. And that is because organic does not mean that the cow was raised on grass or greens. Really important to look at that because they can put anything organic into that food. I'll talk about that more in a future show. So let's just say, though, you say, hey, I'm getting raw milk. Uh, I feel good on it. Great. I'm good with that. Honestly, I'm not saying I'm not good with it. Here's what I want you to do. Just run an IgG food sensitivity test. That's it. Go to stephencabral.com forward slash labs. Just click on the food sensitivity test. Uh, have dairy um, the day before. See how you react to it the next day when you do that test right at home. That's all I recommend. All right. And then you'll know for yourself, 100%. Victoria's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I had a lot of pain on my lower right abdomen, basically right underneath my rib cage, the bottom of my rib cage. I went, got a CT scan to make sure it wasn't appendicitis, and they said it was 
pelvic congestion syndrome. To give some further background, they found a three centimeter uh, ovarian cyst, which I've been reading might be a contributing factor. I also got an ultrasound to confirm it wasn't gallstones. I'm currently dealing with chronic Lyme, mold toxicity. I have high levels of aspergillus. Any recommendations for pelvic floor, or sorry, pelvic congestion syndrome? Knowing all that I've said, I've been taking your foundational supplement protocol, level three, Adrenal Soothe, and the, I don't know what the Cowden protocol for Lyme is, and appreciate your response. Okay, so, I mean, I'm happy to help out with this. I just want you to know, this is another diagnosis like IBS. Okay, you go in, you have bloating, you have gas, you, you constipation, loose stool, and they're like, oh, well, you, you, uh, you're diagnosed with IBS. We got you. No, that just that means they told you that, that you had irritable bowels. And you're like, well, yeah, no kidding, I have irritable bowels. I feel terrible every single day. How does that help me? Well, it doesn't, right? What is pelvic floor condition? Okay, literally the definition of pelvic floor condition is going to blow your mind. It's chronic pelvic pain. Oh, okay. So I have pelvic congestion syndrome. And I told you I came in with pain in my lower right abdomen near my pelvis. And you're saying, oh, yeah, we know what this is. It's uh, pelvic congestion syndrome. And you're like, oh, that's, that's great. That's what I have. Well, what should I do? Well, it's, it stands for chronic pelvic pain. And it just means you have some type of inflammation and dull like pain. You're like, well, yeah, no, that's what I came in for. I don't need a diagnosis. I already knew I had it. Right? So that's why conventional medicine drives me sometimes a little bit crazy. Uh, but here's the thing. So it's always coming from something, right? There's always an underlying root cause. If I were you, this is exactly what I would do. Uh, StephenCabral.com forward slash labs. Run the bacteria and parasite uh, stool test. If you can only do one, all right? If you can only do one, I would do that. Now, if you can do two, I would do the candida metabolic and vitamins test. If you can do three, I would do the stress, hormones, mood, and metabolism test. That's what I would do. I would figure out well, what do you have going on in your gut because you're ascending colon comes up right where that uh, appendix is, all right? So the ascending colon could be backed up, congested, sluggish. Uh, you could have SIBO, uh, small, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I know that SIBO uh, is in the small intestine, not necessarily the large intestine. And the first part of the, the large intestine is the ascending colon. Uh, it's the ileocecal valve, so ili ileum right there. Uh, sorry, it's the ileum and the cecum. So the cecum can backfill into the ileum if it's congested. We see this all the time. Okay. So you can go to stephencabral.com forward slash courses and read and literally go through my gut healing course if you'd like. If you don't want to, that's okay. You can run the labs that we're talking about, but we need to find the underlying root cause. There's obviously inflammation, but what's the inflammation caused by? I'm not a betting man, but either liver congestion, so we can do a 21-day functional medicine detox, but I would only do that after you run the labs to see if there's a gut issue. Hopefully that's helpful. Natalie is up next. Could you please recommend a protocol for gut health following a colonoscopy? Thank you. Okay. Happy to help. Colonoscopy, that's medical conventional medicine, so I can't give you medical-based advice. However, if it were me, I was having a procedure like that, what I would do is this. I would make sure that if I'm having to drink anything that's toxic for that, I'm doing a seven day detox afterwards and I'm trying to use the sauna for detox. Okay. But after that, really what I'm doing is using the clean gut probiotic and the healthy gut support for four weeks. That's what I'm doing. So clean gut probiotic, uh, healthy gut support. And, um, and that's what I would do. And the, do I have a link for those? Uh, I don't know, but you can use the equi.life link, and it's just eqi.life. I always try to give you short links, but if you go to equi.life and you just type in um, clean gut probiotic and then healthy gut support, you'll find them. All right, good question, Natalie. Simon's up. Hi, Dr. Paul. No question this time. I just want to take the opportunity to let you know how grateful I am for the work you do and the opportunity to have my questions, of which I have many, answered in person on my favorite podcast. Your knowledge and protocols have been instrumental in optimizing my health. Until next time, I Bowen. Well, that was very nice. Thank you, Simon. I appreciate that. That was that was really kind of you. Uh, and Ayo Bowen to you as well. For those people who don't know what Ayo Bowen means, uh, I learned it many years ago on one of my internships in, uh, in Ayurveda in Sri Lanka. And they had this beautiful, just literally like hand carved piece of wood above the clinic door. And so every day when I would go to work and I would leave work at the clinic, um, it said Ayubowan, which means 
may you live a long, happy life, or may you live long life is what it translates to. So thank you, Simon. I appreciate that. Same to you. Laura is up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. Hope you're well and your family and loved ones also. My question today is about starches used for thickened food. For example, corn, potato, tapioca starch. Which one would you recommend to use and why? Should we stay away from any of them? I try not to use Anything with corn, just in case, but are potato and tapioca better or not? Thank you for being so amazing. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate that. All these kind words. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, I This is what I do. I try not to use any corn either. I'm not against some like organic corn, uh, hard shell tacos, if, they, if I know they're mold-free, or blue corn uh, taco shells, uh, which is a little bit more of an ancient corn. So I, I like that. Of course, it has to be real blue corn. It can't be, you know, dyed corn. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, I don't eat any corn. I try to stay away from that. Uh, and I don't love tapioca starch either. I'm not radically against tapioca starch, but I'm also not a huge fan of it. And the reason is that anybody with digestive issues, it can cause a little bit more cramping and bloating. I'm okay with potato being used, but you have to understand is that um, you have to make sure that it's it's essentially a non-hybridized GMO um, glutamate derivative that they're really just kind of calling potato extract, right? So we just have to be careful with that. If it's actual potato, I don't have an issue with that. I really don't. Potato is digestible for most people. It's definitely higher glycemic, but for the most part, you're probably, you're talking about a thickener. So you're most likely mixing it with some protein in there. You're probably mixing it with other fiber, other fat. So that's what uh, we may look at. Um, you know, but the truth is that I don't use a lot of those. So like, even when I make my gluten-free, dairy-free pancakes, I'm using oat flour. That's what I found to be the best. Cassava flour just doesn't make the best ones. I like cassava flour, but it just doesn't make the, the best uh, pancakes, in my opinion. And then I'm just using some egg. Um, again, you can use mashed banana if you'd like. I've done that many, many times to make vegan ones for if I'm cooking vegan pancakes for someone. And um, yeah, I've used some mac nut milk. And there's not a whole lot of ingredients in there. Of course, you can find that um, on my, my previous podcast as well. So I'm okay with that. If there's other thickeners that you have in mind, uh, feel free to write in. I'm happy to answer on those, uh, as well, but yeah, that's, that's my answer. All right. Anonymous is up. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Let's do anonymous. Hello, Dr. Paul. I was wondering if you had any advice on fill she clamps. I had uh, my tubal ligation done with them in 2017. I have a few symptoms that have been able to narrow down to my time for ovulation and menstruation that I had not prior to 2017. During ovulation, my lower back around my lower back, hips, and knees ache pretty badly, very painful. I've had an influx of course on my neck, chin, and upper lip. I'll spare the listeners all the details. That is the gist of it, though. Do you think it's related to the Filshi clamps? Also, ovulation and menstruation seem to cause anxiety in me. What do you recommend for that? Thank you so much for your time. Okay, so not, I mean, do I have experience with these specific clamps? No, but certainly with tubal ligation. Um, so what, I mean, there's, there's honestly, there's a direct answer to this because we could talk in circles and you know I can talk in circles. <laughs> so I'm going to spare you that. Uh, really what you want to do is, e even if you only run one lab, honestly, like let's just say in your budget, you can only run one lab. They're hands down one lab and it's the stress hormones, mood and metabolism. And it looks like you still have a fairly normal menstruation cycle, although you obviously have symptoms during that. So you're going to run this lab during your time of symptoms. Most likely for you, if it's like most women in our practice, you're going to run that lab around day 19, 20, or 21. Um, and then you're going to ship it right back. We'll get you those results in about three to four weeks. You'll get on a call with us and we'll share with you exactly what's going on. To me, it sounds like you are moving towards higher levels of testosterone, potentially higher levels of cortisol. You are also looking at estrogen dominance, lower levels of progesterone. I don't know if that's correct, which is, of course, why we lab test. If you can run one more lab or combo, I run the starter kit. And if you can only do one besides that, well, I would probably do the uh, candida metabolic and vitamins test, right? So I would do stress hormones, mood and metabolism first, then the uh, organic acids, uh, the yeah, candida metabolic vitamins test, and then the... Um, minerals and metals if you can. Um, 
yeah, there's so many that you could do. You know what? Th that's definitely what I would do. But if you ever want to do a free lab consultation, anybody listening right now, go to stephencabral.com forward slash health dash coaching. You can sign up. It's $49. And that $49 is just reimbursed to you to health coaching in the future, uh, a lab, whatever you want to do. So literally anonymous, if you had a question, you could just talk to them. It's $49. And then that just, cause again, we just want to speak with people that are really serious about taking control of their health. We just give you the $49 to then put towards the lab of your choice. So you can always do that as well. All right. Great questions today. We're going to keep it at that. I thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I'll be back tomorrow answering another six questions. Take care, everyone.